uh, Rianne just um, helpfully introduced me. I'm a solicitor. I worked for 10 years in private practice um, in London, where I was born and bred, um, doing civil liberties work, um, so civil liberties, social welfare work. I did uh, quite a lot of mental health tribunal work, um, some mental capacity work. Uh, I also did, unfortunately, uh, quite a few inquests where I was representing the families of people who died in prison custody and also following in psychiatric detention. Um, and throughout that whole 10 years of doing that work, I also did public law. And I'm going to get on to what public law is in one second. I'm just going to really briefly introduce um, my organisation. So I work for the Public Law Project, um, and we are a really small, small but mighty um, charity, uh, and a charity with a difference because we are mostly uh, made up of lawyers. And so we have got a casework team, which I have the privilege of leading, and we also have some academic public law researchers, and then we also have a conference and events section where we do, surprise, surprise, legal conferences conferences and events. And we were set up 30 years ago to promote access to justice um, and um, uphold the rule of law, um, and that is very much what we are doing. Um, so, um, so that was a slide with my name on it and my, my personal Twitter handle. Um, I think Disability Wales have been um, tweeting um, public law projects Twitter handle. This is a slide um, which says at the top, what is public law? And um, underneath has a picture of Lady Baroness Bre Brenda Hale, um, who is the president of the Supreme Court. So that's our highest appellate court in England, Wales, and Scotland. Um, she's the boss. And this is her boss in it. Um, in the Supreme Court, um, when she was delivering judgment in the recent um, challenge by Gina Miller. Somebody said that they're not Gina Miller. So this was um, L Lady Hale delivering the judgment in, in the Gina Miller, um, Joanne Cherry case. Um, and I'm really conscious that I'm speaking to quite a kind of varied audience and some people will um, definitely know a thing or two about public law and I'm sure could teach me a thing or two and then some people um, don't know what it is and so I'm going to do a really brief explanation in as simple terms as I can put it um, as to what public law is. Uh, I, th I don't think that I understood really that they, the they, right, the, the powerful ones, need express laws to give them power that they would like to use. I don't think I knew that until about a year into law school. So, it's, so everybody must obey the law, and everybody is um, equal before the law, and that's, that's basically the rule of law. And public law is all about public bodies, so central devolved, uh, central and devolved governments and local authorities and those using their delegated powers. It's all about those public bodies obeying the law, acting lawfully, rationally, fairly and compatibly with human rights obligations and equality rules. So, where they don't act lawfully, what happens, right? Uh, and then there are, some, there are various avenues. One of them is um, engagement. So sit around a table, say, we think you got it wrong. Could you maybe rethink it and, and come again? Uh, there's complaint avenues. There are ombudsman systems. Um, there are potentially, depending on the kind of decision, there are appeal rights. And there is also sometimes judicial review. And so judicial review is where an individual or an organisation asks the High Court, initially, to review the legality of a decision that's been made. It's not about whether the decision maker got the decision right or wrong. It's about whether they have acted rationally, whether they have exceeded their, the power that they had, whether they have acted compatibly with human rights obligations, with equality obligations. So it's about whether the decision was lawful, not about whether it was the right decision. So, uh, I, I should just say briefly about 
I, I think we see public law all the time in the media. We see it all the time. But because generally, I think, our level of legal literacy and education in this country is really poor, we don't necessarily see, we don't necessarily know that it's public law. We don't know that Gina Miller brought a judicial review. We don't, we don't use that terminology, but we see it all the time. All the controversial cases that are in the newspapers usually are judicial reviews. And in this case, um, Gina Miller was asking the court to rule on whether the decision by Boris Johnson to advise the Queen to prorogue Parliament was a lawful decision. It wasn't whether it was the right or the wrong decision. It's definitely a political issue. It's about whether it was a lawful decision. And she said, it was an, they, they said it was an unlawful decision, and they said that in that judgment, she, Lady Hale talks about Parliament being, a, uh, sorry, about the government being accountable to Parliament. And so this is a, an image which really is very rudimentary model of our kind of of our um, t uh, our separation of powers model, our constitution, and it sort of maps out the various kind of powers and there are checks and balances um, in all of those dotted lines. And so, I've talked about judicial review, which is a a very uh, it's um, a small but very important check and balance on the use of power by the executive. So. In that Gina Miller case, the first question was, is this, do we have, does the court have jurisdiction to look at this issue? Is this a decision of high policy or is this a public law decision which is amenable to judicial review? And, and the court said, yes, absolutely, we do, we do have um, jurisdiction to look at this. So we do have that ability to um, review um, and perform an essential check and balance on the power of the executive and do it in her, in her judgment, she reminded us that the executive are, um, are accountable to parliament. So I, how long have I got? So we've got lunch at one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is an example of public law that I was involved in, um, and so I'm going to tell you about it, and it's definitely not the best or the biggest or the most important anything, but I can just tell you about my own personal experience of being involved in this. So I had um, the privilege of representing a woman who was anonymised in the um, proceedings. She went by um, the uh, title of RF in this case, and it was a case... Um, which, in which she was successful and the High Court found in December 2017 that the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions had, had discriminated on grounds of disability um, against her and everybody else affected by unlawfully restricting personal independence payments. And it was, um, it was a, a statutory instrument that had been laid um, earlier in 2017, which sought to exclude those with mental impairments from eligibility to mobility component of personal independence payments. Lots of people would go completely blank at all of that, and I know that there are lots of personal independence payments experts in the room, so I'm hoping that that is landed with you. But basically, for those who don't, it was a judicial review brought by an individual of a statutory instrument, so a piece of secondary legislation, on the grounds that really simply it was massively unfair. And she was an incredible, she is an incredible and very brave individual. There were lots of organisations, big organisations, small organisations, very established NGOs, less established NGOs, who all knew about that unfairness, who all knew about the impact that that statutory instrument and that restriction of the personal independence payments would have on thousands of people with mental health impairments, um, and they didn't feel able to act for lots of different reasons. Um, and she absolutely stood up and, um, and brought that case. I had the privilege of being her solicitor, um, and um, she was successful in, um, in the High Court. I'm going to come back to some of the challenges involved in that case, but I'm gonna, I just want to kind of paint a picture for you right now of ways in which public law can be used, which is not just that kind of straightforward, I've got a case, I'm going to go to court, go to the court, get the decision. Um, and so this is a 
picture, which is a collage. And for me, it represents some of the work that I, I and my colleagues have been doing with small um, NGOs, lots of frontline NGOs, helping multiply, multiple and severely disadvantaged individuals over the last couple of years. Um, and I'll pick out a couple of um, examples. I've been doing quite a lot of work with Gypsy Roman travel organisations around um, EU settled status scheme, um, which is a Brexit-related um, uh, bit of uh, system um, by which EU migrants, all three million of them, um, are being sought to be given indefinite leave to remain. So the legal ability to stay in the country regardless of what happens with Brexit. So I've been doing lots of work about how the EU settled status might impact unfairly on um, Gypsy Roman traveller individuals, um, and that actually did end up, as well as helping them lots with sort of parliamentary work and giving them legal advice which informed their parliamentary briefings, that did also end up in a piece of litigation which was brought by Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants, which was successful and has made that system fairer. Uh, I've been doing quite a lot of work... Oh, hello. Um, sorry. Uh, I've been doing quite a lot of work um, about, uh, about um, sort of criminalisation of poverty. So there's a picture there of a council tax bill. So... Um, uh, custodial sentence being given essentially for non-payment of council tax. I've also been doing work with um, an NGO on the um, on prosecutions for non-payment of TV licence. Um, I did a lot of work with one of the NGOs that I've been working with called Agenda, um, giving them some legal briefings and legal research to inform their engagement with a de domestic abuse bill, um, their parliamentary briefings and their campaign work around that. Um, I've also been working with an organisation which um, works with women at risk um, coming out of the criminal justice system. Uh, there's a picture there of HMP Foston Hall, which is a women's prison um, near Derby, and been working a lot to to kind of skill up their their prison link workers. So um, through discussions with them, realising that they didn't really know what the obligations under the Care Act 2000, the England Care Act 2014 were, and by giving them some very bespoke um, applied training, being able to kind of gear up the work that they're doing to get the women that they're supporting a better deal, better accommodation, better access to services when they come out. So some really kind of very practical application of public law there. Um, I've also been... Um, helping to build a coalition of organisations who work with Gypsy Roman Traveller individuals um, to work around um, these um, very wide injunctions which are being used by local authorities um, to prevent um, Gypsy Roman Traveller people entering their locality. So that's a kind of flavour. Um, and what have I learnt? I've learnt that... Um, Collaboration is at the heart of all of that work, all of that work that I've been doing with those small NGOs, campaigners, activists. Collaboration is absolutely the key. Um, and if you told me when I was working full-time job and putting myself through night school to become a lawyer that it was going to result in me going around the country 15 years later showing people terrible slides with clip art um, with a, of a big heart on it, um, I would have been very surprised. But that is what I've learned, that love is absolutely at the centre of effective um, use of the law because when you've got small organisations who, who have a few resources but incredible expertise and knowledge about their area and their subject, collaborating with other people in your world is absolutely the way to make your work stronger and more effective. And absolutely good collaboration is, the, is, the, um, is a, such an important base of um, effective use of the law in the way that I've been describing. I know, Rianne, that I've got to hurry up. So, accessing judicial review, some really practical stuff. I know that we've talked about um, needing more action and less words. Um, so, this is, this is some of the action. So, legal aid is available for judicial review. You need to find a provider who has a public law contract with a legal aid agency. 
Um, there are few in Wales, but there are some, and I can certainly put anybody in contact with those providers if you would like to um, contact me at the end or send me an email. There's an email right at the end, my email address right at the end of this um, presentation. Timeframes are really difficult in public law, um, so you have to bring a claim as soon as possible and within three months. If you're looking at a commissioning decision, it's even shorter than that, um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about what those are. Um, what can you get through using judicial review? Well, you can potentially solve the problem. You can solve your individual problem. You can solve your group's problem. You might even be able to improve an unfair system. You might be able to do that strategic litigation thing that some people talk about, and you might be able to, to um, extend case law, like RF did. She... That was a, 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 good, a good progression of disability discrimination case law. Um, and that, that is great. You know, you've, you've made the law, you've improved the law, you've improved um, applicable um, case law. But there are some really significant barriers to using the law, um, and one of them is costs, and the costs of everything, the costs of that collaboration work that I just talked about, that is all time, as you'll be well aware, that you know, the resource, your organisational resource, putting into having those difficult conversations with your competitor, collaborator, um, organisations, um, there are the costs of, bring of your organisation even giving the instructions to lawyers to be able to bring the claim. Um, there are huge financial risks in terms of not only paying your own lawyers, although I think often with rights-based organisations, if you've got a good claim, you'll be able to get a lawyer to do it for free or on a, on a no-win, no-fee agreement. And I, we certainly do those, and I know lots of other people who do those, or a discounted fee agreement. But the, the problem is, of course, that you... If you lose litigation, then you are exposed to adverse costs orders, which means that if you issue a claim and you lose, then normally you would expect to have a costs order made against you and you'd be expect to pay the other side's costs. And that is a risk. There are ways of protecting against that. Um, and there are... Um, so cost capping orders are available um negotiation is also available and also um, there are ways of kind of crowdfunding to to raise a kind of fighting fund to protect um you there are of course unintended consequences of um litigation um and there are significant problems with legacy and in implementation and so in rf's case she won that case she won the case there was an, an order that the the statutory instrument was, as she called it, squashed, quashed, like it never existed. Um, but then what happens, as always happens in public law, is the matter then goes back to the team, that goes back to the DWP team to draft a new set of guidance and new statutory instruments if they need to. And then, and then somebody needs to be engaging with them to make sure that they come up with a system which is lawful and fair, et cetera. And um, that implementation and legacy work often falls to the NGOs involved because, say, for example, in RF's case, she had won her case and she had done, she had done the thing that she set out to do and I had done my job as her lawyer. And, then, and so some of those grassroots organisations who are involved in that have been engaging with a DWP, but that is, again, more resource, more time, more cost. And of course, most importantly, uh, I think a point that's best made through this um, slide, uh, and I'll go on a little detour, there's very little academic research on the use of law for social change, right? There's very, very little academic research. Most of the research and evaluation that there is exists uh, is, is American and Canadian um, publications. And this man, Stuart Scheingold, um, is kind of one of the um, key thinkers, and he was writing in the 1970s, reflecting on the civil rights movement. And he is very, very critical about using litigation. And he says this, he says, legal frames of reference tunnel the vision of both activist and analyst, leading to an oversimplified approach to a complex social process. 
an approach which, that grossly exaggerates the role that lawyers and litigation can play in a strategy for change. So he's super critical. There's some more recent research which talks about, from 2009, Cummings and Rose, which talks about litigation being an imperfect but indispensable strategy of social change. And I know that in Wales, in comparison to England, you have a, um, in my perception, a more open uh, relationship with decision makers and with the they um, and you have incredibly progressive laws in comparison to um, the, the, the equivalents in, in England and it, it seems like you've got decision makers who are willing to listen and lots of the problem about litigation is that once the litigation is over you have to continue those relationships and um, obviously litigation can be, in, it is, it's an adversarial process. And so what it does to those relationships is a factor to consider in the balance of deciding whether or not to litigate. Um.